a huge deal. Who's going to get the throne? Hey, who's crazy now? Give me The Tonight Show or give Jay The Tonight Show. I'm taking over all the shows in late night. There are no rules. No one even knows what to expect. Holy moly. I'm in broadcasting history. And now people can be exactly who they are. Chelsea, you was getting gangsta at my party, girl. Yeah, it was. Women are f***ing funny. That's the bottom line. And we're not going anywhere. Lady Gaga with the art pop makeover. Be authentic and authentically weird. Got a lot to do tonight. A whole big world to fix. Let's leave it there. No, don't leave it there. Why would you leave it there? There is a terrible place to leave it. Harvard didn't have a Facebook, and now we're at 100,000 people. The government is now on threat level orange. We must find terror wherever it hides. This is a time when the country is grappling with a post-9-11 world. Thank you very much. Welcome to The Tonight Show. I think at this point, Jay likened himself to the troops cheerleader. We're going to help everyone out there try to for the next hour take our mind off things. Here's a strange thing in the Wall Street Journal today. Toys R Us has announced they might sell their toy division. <laughs> <laughs> right. So what are that? We was toys? Is that their new name? We started out by doing jokes that were completely non-political, non-September 11th. And then you started to be able to make jokes about the tangential things. There was uh, the Taliban. Things are not looking good for the Taliban. Today, one of their top commanders took a head count. Only half of his guys had one. Yeah. <laughs> and then the idea of Osama bin Laden himself, when we found out he, there was, he had 55 brothers and sisters, and he was 27th in there. He goes, it's always the middle child that causes the problems. Leno has a fun, easygoing vibe, and he's, he's, he's just like the everyman type of comedian. Jay talks like most people talk. You know, and I think they completely related to that. How many commandments are there? Ten. Can you name any of them? Freedom of speech. Freedom of speech. Jay was a man of the people. He wasn't playing to the television critics. He wasn't playing to the comedy critics. His humor was for America. So around this time, Jalen's doing great. Basically cruising in first place. Letterman on CBS is in second place. Craig Ferguson takes over what is now called The Late Late Show, which is the show that followed David Letterman. You have Conan. Conan is really hot at the 12.30 hour on NBC. And you have Jimmy Kimmel. He's entered the arena as an ABC alternative. He's on at midnight. Jon Stewart presents a real challenge because he's now grabbing viewers. It's not a big audience, but it's really young. So NBC, look at that and say, well, the guy we think could counter Jon Stewart on, in an ongoing way is Conan. From NBC Studios in New York, it's Late Night with Conan O'Brien. Conan was the voice of a new generation. <laughs> Everyone that I knew in high school and then in college, like, we only cared about Conan. That's a Conan O'Brien mask. Do you like it? No. The viewers expect danger, and I'm giving it to them! I loved all of those bits, like the masturbating bear and triumph. It's an $8 puppet. For some reason, it speaks like a Russian woman. Have you ever talked to a woman without having to give your credit card number? <laughs> It's one of the most successful things we've ever done. Well, you know, before Conan, I did get a shot on The Tonight Show. And I killed, and I got really excited. So I go over to the couch, and Johnny says, did you do this? Bad dog. No. You ruined the couch. I was devastated, but then I heard the same thing happen to Buddy Hackett. If someone said to me, hey, Conan, describe your comedic philosophy, I would say it's a Venn diagram. It's, it's two circles. One is smart, one is silly. You push them partway together, and it's that intersection. Conan O'Brien's success caused him to start getting feelers from other networks. 
He's still at 1230. That's considered triple-A ball. It's time for him to move up to the majors. The first approach we had was uh, from Fox, and they made a pretty heavy pitch at that time. What I remember is that the, the booklets had, were in leather. <laughs> I don't know why, I was just so impressed. They went to the trouble to kill cows to bring me to Fox. We're trying to figure out what to do, and we're looking at our options. And then NBC came to us figuring they're going to lose him at some point, and that Jay's not going to go forever. The only way to really keep both of these guys at NBC was that we were eventually going to have to promise Conan that he would take over The Tonight Show. But we didn't want that to happen anytime soon because we knew Jay was on top of the world. The suggestion was that we offer Jay Leno an extension of his Tonight Show contract for five years and that Conan O'Brien would be made the host of The Tonight Show. This was the ultimate prize. And I think Conan's feeling was, if I can get The Tonight Show and keep doing The Late Night Show, why not? Growing up, this is the show I watched with my dad. And it was the whole tradition. Steve Allen, Parr, and of course, Johnny Carson. This is the chance to be part of that lineage now, and I'm gonna try and live up to this. I asked, where's Jay in all this? What does he think about this? And they came to me and they said, we don't wanna lose Conan O'Brien. And I said, oh, okay, what does that mean? I laid out this five-year plan to him. I think he understood what we were trying to get at. And there was nobody in my time at NBC who was ever more of a team player than Jay Leno. You know, this show is like a dynasty. You, you hold it, and then you hand it off to the next person. And I don't want to see all the fighting and all, and who's better, and nasty things back and forth in the press. So right now, here it is. Conan, it's yours. See you in five years, buddy. OK. Jay congratulated me. Then it all felt friendly and good-natured. We kept them both at NBC. We kept them off of the competition. And we ensured NBC's continued dominance in late night for yet another five years. And by that time, we knew that, you know, Jay would have had an incredibly long run. And I think everybody thought it was a brilliant masterstroke. The world is still waiting for Iraq to comply with its obligation. To reveal and destroy all its weapons of mass destruction. When George Bush first went into Iraq, the country was mostly united around that. But then the weapons of mass destruction are, where are they? An awful lot of people started to question it, not unlike the Vietnam era. And it gave late night comedy license to really sort of go for the jugular. We really haven't heard too much about the situation in Iraq. Uh, what's been going on over there? It wasn't until really George W. Bush and the post 9-11 period that The Daily Show became The Daily Show as we understand it. You deserve better than tyranny and corruption and torture chambers. Yes, you do. <laughs> but really tackling what was going on in government, what we were being told, what we weren't being told. We have begun the search for hidden chemical and biological weapons and already know of hundreds of sites that will be investigated. <laughs> Want to know how that turns out? There was the failure of journalism to really properly question the impetus for going into Iraq. And John Stewart was the one to puncture that. People started to say, this guy is giving us news we're not getting somewhere else. People realized, oh wait, this is not just silly little making fun of things. He's a real critic. John Stewart became the voice of sanity and the voice of reason. The Daily Show put him in the role of the straight man. So the funny people were always the field correspondents. Uh, Rob Corddry has more on the RNC protest today. Rob, what do you got for us? John, a word about the arrests and protesters. 
Not all of them are anarchists. At one point, I think in about 2003, 2004, we had four correspondents. They were Stephen Colbert, Rob Corddry, Ed Helms, and Samantha Bee. The Bush administration has made tort reform one of its main goals. If they have their way, frivolous lawsuits will be a thing of the past. Oh, it was a murderer's row of hilarious, brilliant performers. I was just wondering where you get the balls. And John was very keen on having them all develop different on-air personalities. Or shall we instead embrace the Democrats' vision of a namby-pamby quasi-socialist republic with an all-homosexual army? Out of that, Comedy Central and John Stewart see, here is an incredible gift. Even his show, I was like, what took you so long? <laughs> Open wide, baby bird, because Mama's got a big, fat night crawler of truth. Comedy Central allowed Stephen to rethink and reimagine what a late night, you know, comedic talk show could be. Welcome to the very first Colbert Report. Got a lot to do tonight, a whole big world to fix. Colbert obviously was playing a character uh, inspired in part by Bill O'Reilly. It's been incredible how much of a grasp Stephen had on the format, the character, the point of view. You're not the elites. You're not the country club crowd. I know for a fact that my country club would never let you in. <laughs> the Daily Show attempted to expose hypocrisy. Stephen Colbert on The Colbert Report was hypocrisy. Like any good newsman, I believe that if you're not scared, I'm not doing my job. The fact that Colbert was able to choose the ironic opposite position of what you should really feel about the topic and then use comedy to then convey that to you is really, really, really difficult. And that brings us to tonight's word. Truthiness. The first show, he did that very famous word uh, on truthiness. We are divided between those who think with their head and those who know with their heart. It wasn't something that he had worked on forever, written in a couple of hours that day. And what about a rock? If you think about it, maybe there are a few missing pieces to the rationale for war, but doesn't taking Saddam out feel like the right thing? <laughs> If I had to pick a moment when late night comedy became a little more of what I call resistance comedy, where you're like, okay, you're gonna know where I stand on these issues, was at the White House Correspondents' Dinner when Stephen Colbert confronted George W. Bush. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That moment allows him to stand on stage five feet away from President Bush and really change satire history. Now, I know there's some polls out there saying that that this man has a 32% approval rating. We know that, that polls are just a collection of statistics that reflect what people are thinking in reality. And reality has a well-known liberal bias. It started with nervous laughter, and it ended with crickets. You would never see Johnny Carson do that in front of a, a, the president of the United States. He didn't get good reviews for that. What happened, and this is the burgeoning power of the internet, was a clip of that went up online. And that started getting a lot of people who agreed with the political side of what Colbert was saying and the comedic guts to do that in front of a president. Like, oh, you can do this in political comedy and be rewarded for it? Jimmy Kimmel has a different trajectory than most late night hosts. Kimmel had the challenge of trying to find his way into a late night hosting position, having come from shock jock radio background and the man show. It's always hard to bridge that divide between who you are and who people think you are. If your idea of who I am was the guy from the man show, you know, that's a cartoon. At ABC, he was going to have to reach a far broader audience. And there would have been many times they could have folded the tent on Jimmy. 
But ABC left him on the air and allowed him to find his voice, allowed him to grow into that position. It took a long time, and it was hard to get really great bookings in the first years. You just can't do a talk show without anyone to talk to. I would have to spend every afternoon calling around to try to get a guest for that night. It was funny because we weren't getting necessarily the greatest guests. So Jimmy came up with this throwaway joke. Apologies to Matt Damon, we ran out of time. Apologies to Matt Damon, ran out of time. Matt Damon, apologies, we ran out of time. It just made the people on the show laugh. It was a little inside joke. Then we heard from Matt Damon's people and they said, keep doing that, we think it's funny. And then for my 40th birthday, my ex-girlfriend, Sarah Silverman, with my cousin Sal and one of our writers, Tony Barbieri, they came up with this idea. Hey, Jimmy, it's me. It is kind of funny that probably the single most successful thing we've ever done on our show is something I had absolutely nothing to do with. I've been thinking about you a lot, and uh, I've been needing to tell you something. I'm Matt Damon. She's Matt Damon. That changed everything. That Matt Damon video was the first late night viral video. And we followed it with the I'm effing Ben Affleck video. I'm Ben Affleck! Five years in, we became a show that people had heard of. Is someone here Ben Affleck? I am. Celebrities suddenly wanted to be on the show. And that was a turning point in a way for the show. People suddenly saw it had a kind of uh, outlook that was fresh and funny. The Dow tumbled more than 500 points. And if you want specific policy, you can ask me. You can even play Stump the Candidate if, if you want to. The President of the United States is Barack Obama. As the years went on, I would have conversations with Jay Leno about the five-year plan for Conan O'Brien to take over The Tonight Show. And I would sense that he was hurt by the decision. You ever sleep in a hospital? You know, I spent the night, I was there 24 hours, and I, and I had a horrible dream. I couldn't breathe. I felt like I was suffocating. Then I woke up and realized, oh, Conan was holding a pillow over my face. I said, hey, hey! Five years goes by pretty quickly, and, uh, and we got to that moment, and we said, oh, shit, because the fact is, uh, Jay was still doing incredibly well. So after, like, 17 years, they still have the number one guy. Jay had the point of view that I shouldn't leave until I start to decline. I felt an obligation to the fact that I gave my word to Conan about The Tonight Show. So now we're faced with a dilemma of, we have two guys who both want The Tonight Show and Jay is still on top of the world, what do we do? We were hearing that ABC was offering Jay Leno the 1130 spot. Have you thought about this whole thing, this ABC thing, about whether you, you want to come over here and I more importantly, what will become of I, me? I don't know what will happen. I thought, well, you know what? I'd rather follow an hour of The Tonight Show than a half hour of Nightline. And then, you know, in five years or whatever, when Jay was done, I'd move into the 11.30 slot. I said to NBC, would you release him from my contract? They said, no, we want to keep you here. I said, well, oh, okay, uh, what are your ideas? NBC wasn't doing well in prime time. And so uh, we had an idea to strip a variety show across our 10 o'clock hour. They tell us we're going to give Jay a primetime show at NBC. And I think one of us asked, which night? And they said, every night. Every night, Monday through Friday at 10. Yes. What, ha, wait, what? And we all just looked at each other like, this makes no sense. Basically, what you're doing is offering someone a two-liter bottle of Pepsi just before you 
offer them a two liter bottle of Coke. And in this analogy, I'm the Coke, because that's the better drink. When the NBC said to Jay, you know what, Conan's going to take over your job in five years, that's when you say, OK, fine, no hard feelings. You call ABC, you call Fox, you try to get my job, you leave. You don't, you don't, yeah, I'll, yeah OK, but if you, I'll be in the lobby, you know, if you need me. <laughs> don't hang around. I have a little story that I would like to tell you and the home viewers as well. Do you feel like a story? So in 2009, Letterman's still making money, getting all the best criticism, but he's always in second place. At that point, he came on the air and totally out of the blue starts discussing this blackmail plot. There's a, a letter uh, in the package, and it's, uh, it says that uh, uh, I know that you do some terrible, terrible things. <laughs> Letterman was famous for his ironic distance, that when he said something, you sort of assumed he didn't mean it. The creepy stuff was that I have uh, had sex with women who work for me on this show. Now, my response to that is, yes, I have. <laughs> The audience, at first, they kind of laughed in a place that they really shouldn't have laughed because they didn't know what was happening. Well, now, why is that funny? That's, I mean... These were employees, people he could hire or fire, that he's now admitting on the air he had sex with. It was a real shock, and it definitely hurt the show, but he survived it. I think it was both evidence of his incredible skill as a speaker and also the connection that he built with his audience over many years. I hurt a lot of people. I have nobody to blame but myself. How did it, you make it better? I'm still trying to fix it, but I, I can't forgive that behavior. It's, it's my fault, everything. Hey, everybody, it's December 9th, 2008, and uh, you've all heard the big news from NBC. Jay Leno is moving to 10 o'clock which I think couldn't be better. That's great, because Leno goes on for an hour, then the news, then Conan for another hour, and we're just uh, ramping it up. When Conan got called up to the majors to host The Tonight Show, Warren Michaels thought that Jimmy would make a great replacement at 12.30. 12.30 shows get underestimated because they're way more influential than people think by just the numbers of people watching, because they have the right people watching. They're just joining us. Yes, these are my real shoulders. <laughs> like everyone else, I saw Jimmy Fallon when he became a, a player on Saturday Night Live. I'm Jimmy Fallon. I'm Tina Fey, and here are tonight's top stories. She looks like a flower and she sings like a bee. My strengths are Saturday Night Live, where I started as an impressionist. So I do impressions, I sing, I play guitar. Jimmy Fallon was not a stand-up comedian. Jimmy had always been part of an ensemble at Saturday Night Live. And the one thing that people don't fully appreciate is how hard it is to do a daily show in late night with you out there all on your own. Lauren Michaels' advice was like, get in front of the cameras and get used to the cameras again, because you haven't done that in a while. Hey everybody, on today's episode, the producers wanted me to try out my uh, interview skills. Before we were even on the air, we made uh, short videos uh, behind the scenes that we put out on the internet. To me, the internet was what late night was, which is experimental. Uh, they wanted to see what I would do in each position if I had a bad guest. How was uh, your summer vacation? Did you uh, do anything crazy? I'm sorry? Gets that confidence going, gets your rhythm going with the audience, and you, be you feed off that energy. Yo. Two minutes, Jimmy. Oh, thanks, Steve. I'll come back and get you. Cool. Hi, Conan. Hey. <laughs> I know you probably want your privacy right now, but I just haven't had time to clean out my dressing room. Uh, so will you be taking Jay's old dressing room when you go to L.A.? Jay isn't leaving. <laughs> right around there. When we started, we were a little under uh, the radar because everyone was talking about this Conan to Leno transition. I mean, I look back now, we did so many bad ideas and things, but it was so much fun. We got a little game here we're going to try on our very first night. It's called Lick It for Ten. If you have a bit that the audience likes that you can do more than once, 
It's the greatest. That's what thank you notes was for me. <laughs> thank you, gift bags, for saying I care enough to put your gift in a slightly fancier bag than the one I bought it in. <laughs> Just as Conan O'Brien came along and changed the program from what David Letterman had done, Jimmy Fallon came along and changed it from what Conan O'Brien had done. It's so much fun. I, I can't tell you how much I'd love it. He brought his own unique sense of comedy to the program, and I think that's why it felt so fresh again. Write jokes, get dressed, brush teeth, check, move to L.A. Move to L.A.? <laughs> Going to L.A. was exciting. And I was nervous. I was really nervous. It was a different level of stress. He did this running across the country bit, and it was absurd. But it was an existential moment because there is a drive in him that I don't know if even he's fully aware of, like, what it is. <laughs> I loved the first show. It was thrilling. It's the Tonight Show with Conan O'Brien. Thank you very much. At least we know the applause sign works. That's nice. <laughs> Will Ferrell came out. He's my favorite funny person. Eddie Vedder gave me his guitar, and they had all signed it. I just thought. I can't believe I get to do this. Good Lord, Pearl Jam, we'll take a break. We'll be right back. Thank you so much. The first couple of weeks of results were very promising and surpassed what the expectations were. But I think Conan was feeling the pressure, and who wouldn't? Conan gets three months on the air as the host of The Tonight Show before Jay Leno gets his primetime show at 10 o'clock and becomes Conan's lead-in again. Late night television is very dependent on lead-in. So having Jay at 10 o'clock, our hope, my hope, was that he would do really well. Didn't work out that way. Jay was incredibly talented, but the program didn't work. Nobody wants to see a late night show at 10 o'clock, they found out. We were branded the biggest bomb in the history of primetime television. NBC always considered the Jay Leno show here a bit of an experiment in prime time, but after only four months, they've decided to end that experiment. I've been in this business for 30 years. The most difficult conversation that I've had in those 30 years was the one where, where we had to tell Conan that we were going to take him out of the 11.30 time slot and move Jay back in there. And I was just listening to this, and I couldn't I believe that adults had this idea. NBC thought, let's get Jay on at 11.30, let's have Conan on in The Tonight Show at 12, let's have Jimmy on at 1, and then we'll see what happens. I think that they were just going to slowly close off the tap that gave our, us lifeblood. I said to my staff, I go, guys, we're lucky we have jobs. <laughs> so just keep your head down, and let's keep making entertainment. And Conan says, I want to write a statement. Conan released his People of Earth manifesto. People of Earth. I think it was my way of acknowledging the inherent silliness of the situation. But I also laid out exactly what had happened, how I felt about it, and that's when the shit hit the fan. Conan O'Brien told NBC and the wider world today he no longer wants to host The Tonight Show if the show is to air in any other time slot. In the end, Conan was just too hurt and wouldn't do it. And so we decided moving Jay back into 1130 was the right call. Here's Jimmy Kimmel! 
You know, I came from a background in radio of fighting with your competition. And at that time, it seemed ripe to fight with Jay. So I did the show dressed as Jay, and we had a lot of fun with it. Hello, hello. My, my name is Jay Leno, and um, let it hereby be known that I'm taking over all the shows in late night. All right. The next day, Jay called me and he said, I thought that, you know, it was, it was funny. But then they asked me to do their show the next night, and I said, yeah, I'll, I'll do it, but we have to talk about the elephant in the room, which is this thing with Conan. And they said, yes, no problem, don't worry. We have 10 questions. Question number one. It was 10 questions, the 10 at 10, and right before the show, they send me the questions, and they're not about what I'd agreed to talk to at all. Number five, you're known for pranks. What's the best prank you ever pulled? So I felt that I was being bamboozled, and so I reacted by making every question about what I wanted to talk about. I think the best prank I ever pulled was, I told a guy, I told a guy that five years from now, I'm gonna give you my show. And then when the five years came, I gave it to him, and then I took it back almost instantly. Wow. Wow. It was a lot Hello there, I'm Conan O'Brien. Sorry if I'm a little late. I had a job interview at Lady Foot Locker. <laughs> I'm still on the air, and I'm doing comedy about what's going on with NBC, and man, was that fun. It's gonna take NBC several years to pay this off. It's a doozy. We just bought this using their credit card from the Smithsonian Institute. Please welcome a rare fossil skeleton of a giant ground sloth, ladies and gentlemen. It was so freeing to get to do that. My writers have never been funnier. He's spraying beluga caviar on an original Picasso. Total cost for this bit, $65 million. People were calling in angry. He's destroying Picasso's, that punk. I was just, I couldn't have been happier. I think the longer we just sit here, the more uncomfortable it will make Jay. <laughs> if you lose a television show, there's a part of you that feels rejected by America. I'm Jay Leno, your host, at least for a while. So <laughs> when we went back at 11.30, there was nothing, oh, yay, about it. It was just march on. Here we go. We really were determined to do a great show and prove that we were worthy to be back. That was my goal, to walk out of there number one again. So when Conan makes a settlement with NBC, part of the deal is He's forbidden from doing anything on television for eight months. I was legally prohibited from appearing in, you know, radio, television. He cannot attend an opera. <laughs> but nothing in there about social media. So I started this Twitter account. And immediately, it just blew up. <laughs> like folk heroes, you know? Like, which is the dumbest thing in the world that like folk heroes of late night television. Yes, we yes, we the base rallied around him and became this huge movement. But I didn't have a job and was trying to figure out what do I do next? TBS appeared on the scene completely unexpectedly. And so Conan and his producer, Jeff Ross, went over to meet with the TBS people. They gave us a compelling argument to go there. You'll be on at 11 o'clock, not at 11.30, so you'll get a jump on the network shows, all the things that cable could provide. These guys were just straightforward. They said, we like you, do whatever you want to do. It was kind of intriguing. <laughs> Conan, I think you'll find our terms very attractive. I 
think we have a deal. Thank you, and uh, welcome to my second annual first show. That's... At TBS, when you check in on Conan O'Brien, he's still Conan O'Brien. He's still doing great work. It's just to a somewhat smaller audience. I am happy to report right now, I just got this news, that we are already number one in TBS's key demographic, people who can't afford HBO. <laughs> Once you get into cable, people are able to watch what they want in a niche fashion. When people of color get shows, it's not through like a major network. <laughs> Wanda Sykes he had a show briefly at Fox. Let me be the first person on Fox not to pick on President Obama. There are these tiny opportunities for people of color, and then they are gone as quickly as they arrived. I think that if you gave Wanda Sykes the amount of resources and time to figure it out, of course she could figure it out. Cable did give opportunity to women and to some minorities who were not getting the chances to get the late night uh, openings when they came up. I think a lot of the time, the mistake we make is we don't truly think of diversity, we think of tokenism. The truth is you have to create genuine content. Late night comedy as we know it is a space that has been the white man's boys club. Guys think dicks are funny because dicks are funny and we engage with dicks more than women do because they're attached to us. And then when a woman comes in, she goes like, hey, maybe there's another way to tell this joke. I don't even know what I'm gonna say before I say it, it just flies out of my mouth. What happens when you find yourself in a situation where sincerity is paramount? What? Well, the way you're looking at me makes me want to cover up my vagina. <laughs> I know 50% of people think I'm not an obnoxious, and 50% of people don't. And that's pretty much the way it's gonna go when you delve into anything different. Black guys I know love big asses, but- Well, you know, we need a little bit to hold on to. I appreciate that, because I look at your body, and I think that would that's a lot of meat. I like that. I think but as far as being in part of the boys' club, I would only really notice it when it was pointed out to me, because women are funny. That's the bottom line. Next topic. <laughs> Okay, let's talk about sex addiction. Okay. For the longest time when I had watched late night television, we were either spoken to or spoken for. You are looking at the first Latino host of his own late night talk show. When I was doing my show, I was into the huge diversity. My Puerto Rican brother from another mother. I mean, I interviewed Prince. And Prince didn't do shows. Let me ask you what all the other late night talk shows are asking themselves. Why? <laughs> this show represents all people. And I see all kinds of guests on here. And, uh, There's no question that a fairer sampling of humanity will produce better comedy. Thank you very much, Lady Gaga. Makeover. When I started, late night seemed so packaged and shiny floors and no mistakes. So my goal with this show was to just be authentic and authentically weird. You're always but so happy. I am, I'm a positive guy. You are? Yes, I'm an optimist. Yeah, you, you, you carry the light, man. You really do. I never thought about being the only gay guy in late night. It's a gay show! Being gay has always been just part of who I am. What I realized was I had a lot of moms coming to see me with their gay sons. And the moms said to me, you don't know what it's meant to watch your show with my son, like for him to see that you're okay and you're happy and everything's gonna be okay. I, I'm, I'm getting a little emotional now because it just, it's, I never had that. I still think in a world of audience fragmentation, The Tonight Show is the gold standard. It's always been a critical piece of the NBC brand. We have smart bombs and dumb reporters. Isn't that unbelievable? <laughs> Jay stepped in there, dug himself out of that hole. That's amazing because the pie has been cut up so much. We did four more years and then we had come to the end of our run. 
Thank you, Rodney. I, I don't like goodbyes. <laughs> NBC does. I don't care. I don't. I don't care. As sad as it was that it ended, I felt really good walking out there. And what people say to me, hey, why don't you go to ABC? Why don't you go to Fox? Why don't you go? I didn't know anybody over there. These are the only people I've ever known. We had all been through a lot together, grown up together, matured together, and it was an emotional moment. I love Jay. He's such a kind person. I never saw Jay treat anyone poorly. Mm. What I was gonna say is that he just knew I would do anything to protect him. We've been friends for 40 years, and he's about to do his last goodbye. And I'm sitting there, and, and he reached over and, and grabbed my hand for a second and said, I'm really glad you were here. And that's as emotional as Jay gets. And in closing, I want to quote Johnny Carson, who was the greatest guy to ever do this job. And he said, I bid you all a heartfelt good night. Anybody who takes the Tonight Show job knows it comes with a gigantic amount of pressure because it has been the defining show of late night. So I think that was really important to me and to Jay to do it the right way if it was going to be done. Jay Leno now is uh, being replaced, and this is the second time this has happened. Yes, yes. I, I mean, it's in, <laughs> in crazy. Uh, he's being replaced by a, a uh, younger uh, late night uh, talk show host. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs>